Hi everyone, I'm Jack the Rambling Rack Intern. I hope that you're doing well. I'd like to discuss The Night Watchman by Louise Erdrich, which I finished reading this week, and it's a wonderful book. Uh, it was a justifiable Pulitzer Prize winner this year, published in 2020, and a truly phenomenal reading experience. Um, I think The Night Watchman really showcases two aspects of Erdrich's writing that make her such a compelling author, make her such a compelling voice. The first of those is the way that Erdrich creates the world in her novel and populates it with characters, as any great writer does. But the characters that Erdrich creates, she seems to have this real deep love for. Um, even, even when they're characters who are evil or, or are brutal characters, she loves them as human beings. She creates characters that reveal the dignity that exists within each of us. Um, and, and we see characters who aren't just experiencing triumph or experiencing tragedy, but who are living through these. Uh, their choices may not be the choices we want. Uh, the, 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 they may not be the choices that the plot would want, but they feel natural. They feel authentic. Um, and, and underneath all, all of it is that real compassion for each character, that compassion for each voice, the unique voice that each character has. Um, and it's something that Erdrich excels at. It's something that when, when I think of Erdrich's writing, it's something she excels at. And it feels comparable to what George Eliot accomplished in Middlemarch or Toni Morrison or Jane Austen in their novels, where there are so many different humans inhabiting the book, not just characters on a chessboard. The other aspect of the writing that feels just fantastic um, and is not unique to The Night Watchman, but is across Erdrich's best novels, are all of the little details that fill in that world, that make it feel three-dimensional, that lift it off the page. Um, and I'll read a passage that shows that. But Erdrich really excels at giving us this sense of what life is like in the community, the smells. Um, as with certainly all of the Erdrich novels I've read, this book is set in the, uh, among the Ojibwa, among the uh, Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa, which Erdrich is a member. And it, it, it allows us to see what life is like in the 1950s on that reservation. The ways in which, um, the, what the homes feel like. Not just what they look like, but what they feel like. What does it feel like to live um, in this home when winter comes in North Dakota? Uh, what does it feel like when the rain falls on the ground? And, and that's what the passage will look at. How, how do characters who have the, an ancestral language, some of the older characters do, and younger characters maybe have picked up a few words, how do they intersperse that ancestral language, that home language, into English when they're uh, conversing with each other or when they're reflecting on ideas? And so that, that lived-in world is just fantastic. But I want to read a passage that you know, shows some of that. Patrice was nearly home when the clouds thickened to a dark sheet. She started running, then quit. Her shoes, she couldn't ruin them. She bent over, took them off, bundled them beneath her coat, and kept walking in the rain. Took the grassy turnoff that led through the woods. Going barefoot was not a problem. She had done that all her life, and her feet were tough. Cold now, half numb, but tough. Her hair, her shoulders, and back grew damp. But moving kept her warm. She slowed to pick her way through places where water was seeping up through the mats of dying grass. Rain tapping through brilliant leaves the only sound. She stopped. The sense of something there with her, all around her, swirling and seething with energy. How intimately the trees seized the earth. How exquisitely she was included. Patrice closed her eyes and felt a tug. Her spirit poured into the air like song, wait. She opened her eyes and threw her weight into her cold feet. This must be how Gerald felt when he flew across the earth. Sometimes she frightened herself. Um, and so... <laughs> I just feel like I, I could experience that, that I know what that feels like on my feet, on my shoulders. Uh, and it's just, it, it's, a, it's a fantastic moment for a character, but for the reader as well. And there, there are moments like that throughout The Night Watchman um, that fill the book. But there's another aspect to the book that I think made it really, really strong. And that's the real life aspect. Um, because this book is set in the immediate aftermath of the U.S. Congress announcing the 1953 Indian Termination Act, an act which ultimately um, did a, a pass and occur, and multiple uh, reservations were terminated. The uh, people who lived, the Native Americans who lived on those reservations were either sent to other reservations where their land um, was purchased from them, and they uh, were given some money to go live in cities. Uh, there were multiple um, tribes and reservations that basically became extinct. Some were turned over to uh, states. Others fought back, and that's that's the key um, sort of political narrative that's under, undercutting 
everything that occurs in this book. So we have a community, we, it's filled with all these characters who we absolutely love, even when we laugh at some of them or shake our heads at others, but it's filled with all of these human characters and there's this absolute dread across the book knowing that if things don't work out when they go before Congress in Washington, this entire community is wiped off the face of the earth. Like they, they will not survive as a community. They can't just be picked up and moved into a neighborhood in a city. Like their way of life, their their family bonds, their communal bonds will be gone. Um, and so that gives a real deep urgency to so many different moments in the book. Um, even when we see relationships forming or relationships disintegrating, it's in the background of this, you know, massive existential crisis for a community. And the fact that Erdrich's own grandfather was living at this time and was was a leader in the fight to um, maintain the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa Reservation uh, gives it a real passion. It gives it an absolute you know sense not just of authenticity but passion in her writing that this is something that she deeply cares about as she's creating this fantastic book. And so that that lent that gave it something special, an extra something special I found in my reading. Uh, but there are so many characters to love. We do ha uh, see the effect of, of you know, some individuals who have tried moving to the city and how there might be some money there, but there also can be like deep, deep danger, um, particularly for Patrice, the character I'd read about earlier, her sister, who has essentially disappeared. And so they, they're worried about her. And part of the book is trying to determine, you know, is she alive? What happened to her? Uh, she has a baby. So who will take care of the baby? What will that be like? As, and, and that's all happening. It's an immediate need for a family within as a microcosm within the larger need of the community of will they exist this time next year or will their tribe be terminated? But I want to read another passage because again, it's just so filled with details that, that uh, amaze. From the top of the cradle board, Wood Mountain was using Zanet's finest sanding tool. Horsetail plants split and glued onto a piece of wood. It was bringing out the narrow lines in the white cedar. He had a jar of tea and a jar of vinegar in which he'd left some pennies for a week. After he'd sanded the wood smooth, he painted the bottom of the cradle board with the tea, which gave it a soft brown color. He painted the top of the wood with the penny vinegar, which tinged the wood with pale blue, including the headguard. He tied several pieces of sinew to the headguard. Sometimes he found small ocean shells while working in the fields. Some were whirled, others were tiny grooved scallops. He drilled holes in them and hung them from the lengths of sinew. Barnes was saying there used to be an ocean here, he said to Thomas, from the endless way back times. Think of it, Vera's baby will be playing with these little things from the bottom of the sea that was here. Who could have known? We are connected to the way back people here in so many ways. Maybe a way back person touched these shells. Maybe the little shells in them disintegrated into the dirt. Maybe some tiny piece from that creature is inside us now. We can't know these things. Us being connected here so far back gives me a peaceful feeling, said Wood Mountain. That's what it's all about, said Thomas. And now we're putting another man in the earth, maybe a drunk, but he wasn't always a drunk. Sometimes when I'm out and around, said Wood Mountain, I feel like they're with me, those way back people. I never talk about it, but they're all around us. I could never leave this place. And thankfully, uh, that, that fight as we know, historically did succeed and they didn't have to leave this place. Um, but many other people uh, did in other parts around the US. Um, this, this book though, with, with all that passion, with all that life, it's just an excellent, excellent novel to read. And it's a wonderful world to inhabit as so many of Erdrich's novels are. So I was reminded of, of course, those and some other works. Two of my favorites are, um, uh, help form sort of a loose trilogy. So The Plague of Doves, and The Roundhouse, which uh, won the National Book Award. And these are both really, really enjoyable. I think each has different strengths. I think The Roundhouse is maybe slightly uh, more enjoyable, a little bit better, but they're both fantastic. They do form sort of a, a loose trilogy. The third uh, book in that was La Rose, which I didn't enjoy as much. Um, also, Love Medicine was uh, either Erdrich's first novel or one of her very early novels, and uh, is, was published about 30 years ago, and that's a really good book as well. But one of the things I love about Louis Erdrich's writing is we get these amazing books, but they also showcase another place, another community, another way of life. And we get to explore and, and empathize with the people who live uh, in that community. Someone else who accomplishes that is Tony Hillerman, uh, much closer to my home. So his books are mysteries, they're police procedurals, but they're set among the Navajo tribal nation. 
and the police force there. And so these, uh, these books take place three, four hours from where I live. And they're, they're very, very um, enjoyable police procedurals. But again, Hillerman uses that as a window to explore his culture, to explore uh, life for the Navajo. And he brings in other uh, Native Americans as well. Um, the second book involves the Zuni Pueblo. Uh, there are some books that involve uh, characters who are Hopi. And that's just that he, he really pushes at this idea that, um, you know, each Native American uh, tribe and community was very much had its own identity, its own culture, its own language and aspects. And that that's, that's really important that they cannot be uh, grouped together. And so this is a wonderful series. Skinwalkers is one of the strongest ones. So the portable North American Indian reader, again, is a good resource. Uh, it's not maybe the, the best one volume, but it's, it's a very compact uh, one volume that, that produces a lot. And among here are a couple of songs from uh, the Ojibwa, of which I will share a single passage. It's a spring song. As my eyes look over the prairie, I feel the summer and the spring. And what's uh, beautiful is that the song before that is from the Navajo and the song after it is from the Zuni, mentioning Hillerman. Uh, as I had mentioned, of course, I certainly am reminded of George Eliot every time I, I read a Louis Erdrich novel that I enjoy quite a bit. And, and really that idea that there are there are, and there were aspects of The Night Watchman where you I wanted certain, you know, maybe relationships to work out or I wanted people to be able to, to take a step forward on something. And they don't. And there, there's that sense of like, oh, but also that feels real. <laughs> it feels real. And I think Eliot uh, was able to do much of the same. Another uh, special aspect to Erdrich is that she will give voice to so many different characters. She wants to allow them a moment to sort of have a solo, to breathe, to have their highlight within her book. Um, and so we, we get moments from characters who are, are not, you know, really characters we're rooting for in any way, yet we get their moment. And hilariously in The Night Watchman, we get one chapter that really is from the point of view of a dog. Uh, someone else, of course, who excelled at, you know, jumping from third person to third person to third person points of view across her books would have been Virginia Woolf. Um, I read Dead Girls from Seva Almada earlier this year, and I, I was amazed by it. I was horrified by it. Uh, but there are the, the same passion and urgency that exists in this book existed in The Night Watchman, even though this is really more nonfiction and The Night Watchman is fiction. The way in which the writer is willing to to take a stand on something and, and really point out either what happened or what is happening is, I think, admirable. Uh, Rabbit Boss from Thomas Sanchez uh, details uh, life um, in a Native American community in western Nevada and eastern California. It's a pretty good book. Fat City from Leonard Gardner for boxing. There's a, a number of boxing matches across the Night Watchman that do uh, they're, they're well written, but every time I think of boxing, I think of the great fat city. I had mentioned uh, Morrison, of course, and um, Home in particular. Uh, maybe it's because it's the most recent Morrison novel I read. Uh, and then in terms of nonfiction, In the Spirit of Crazy Horse from Peter Matheson details uh, um, aspects of the American Indian movement, the aftermath of the Indian Termination Act, um, the Wounded Knee Occupation, a number of different events going on somewhat about a generation after the Night Watchman occurred. Um, and Matheson, while not a Native American, really felt that there was an important story uh, that needed to be told uh, really more around the um, Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota. And uh, that resulted in this book. And it's excellent, one I highly encourage everybody to read. So let me know if you have a favorite novel from Louise Erdrich. Maybe it's The Roundhouse. Maybe it is The Night Watchman. Uh, so maybe it'll be the uh, one that just came out this month, The, the Sentence. So uh, again, I hope everybody's doing well. All the best.